Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, Part 1, in the Anglican Journal, Lambeth Honors Three Canadians, McDonald's Prize Revoked. Former National Indigenous Anglican Archbishop Mark McDonald was among three Canadian Anglicans honored by the Archbishop of Canterbury with a prestigious award this month. But McDonald's award was revoked following the Anglican Church of Canada's announcement that he had acknowledged sexual misconduct. On March 7th, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby announced the 37 recipients of the 2022 Lambeth Awards, which recognize contributions to community service, worship, evangelism, education, and ecumenical and interfaith cooperation. Recipients came from four continents, the Americas, Europe, and Africa and included three lay and ordained leaders from the Anglican Church of Canada. MacDonald received the Cross of St. Augustine for services to the Anglican Communion for outstanding service to support the Communion's role in creation care and climate justice, including the voice of Indigenous peoples. We'll pick that up in our next session. We turn to the Trinity Journal and the ancient Israelite calendar. A little bit of a wonky piece. It's going to go on for a little while. But when does the Hebrew day begin? day begins with the evening, Erev, throughout scripture. The word Ma'arev signifies the place of sunset. The fast of the day of atonement is kept on the ninth day of the month at sunset, from the evening until the evening of the tenth day. Below we will see the Lamed preposition is used to indicate time just prior to to sunset, toward sunset. This shows that one day ends and another begins at sundown. In the first month, you are to eat unleavened bread from the 14th day of the month at sunset, Ba'arev, until the 21st day of the month at sunset, Be'arev. An exhaustive treatment of all 35 occurrences of Ba'arev is unnecessary since they all fit the end of the day. Exodus helps clarify the use of these critical terms. In Exodus 12 of 16, manna came on the first day of the week. This requires the datum point of the beginning of the chapter, Exodus 16, 1, to be Saturday as what 12.18 and 23.32 in Exodus 13 as the day's end. It came to pass at sunset. The quail came up and covered the camp. The quail are sent at sundown so that they may, may gather, prepare, and cook the quail during the twilight. You shall eat meat at twilight between the two evenings. Thus, the entire passage clearly portrays sunset as marking the break between sacred time, Saturday afternoon, and that which followed sunset, since sending the quail at sunset was didactic, teaching the Israelites to avoid the work of cooking food on the Sabbath. This explains the specificity of the language in Exodus 16, 12. We turn our attention to Lambeth Conference and Michael Ramsey. <clears throat> Ramsey is president and host. It naturally fell to Ramsey to preach the opening service of the Lambeth Conference in Canterbury Cathedral 
on July 25, 1968. The note of urgency returned and more starkly. Today the earth is being shaken and the shaking was of society as well as the churches. Ramsey spoke of the terrible contrast between the world of affluence and the world of hunger, the explosions of racial conflict, the amassing of destructive weapons, the persistence of war and killing. And man, they say, has come of age. But while many things are cracking, melting, and disappearing, it was nonetheless possible to distinguish the things which are shaken and to receive gratefully the kingdom which is not shaken, the kingdom of our crucified Lord. The faith would always be folly and scandal to the word, never truly popular, and cannot adapt itself to every passing, passing fashion of human thought. But it will be a faith alert to distinguish what is shaken and is meant to go, and what is not shaken and is meant to remain. And in the radically changed relations between the churches, we shall love our own Anglican family, not as something ultimate, but because in it and through it, we and others have our place in the one true church of Christ. There will come into existence united churches, not describably Anglican, but in communion with us, in sharing with us what we hold to be the unshaken eth essence of Catholicity. The question then of the nature of the Anglican communion itself could be faced without fear, without anxiety, because the faith in things which are not shaken. Perhaps the Anglican role in Christendom may come to be less like a separate encampment and more like a color in the spectrum of a rainbow, color bright and unself-conscious. Now for Anglicans and international relations, discussing the Kellogg Pact, as well as the League of Nations. Meanwhile, in the journal Theology, which Selwyn edited, the sub-dean of Westminster Abbey, W.H. Carnegie, found that taken in the literal sense, Resolution 25 was decisive. Yet he went on, the writers of the report do not intend them to be interpreted thus. They make no direct attempt to mitigate the absolute character of their inhibition. They indicate no principle which, under circumstances, may justify a crush Christian in disregarding it. They acknowledge that such circumstances have arisen and may rise again. Carnegie was not at all convinced that the prospect of civilized nations building peace by disarmament did not make them vulnerable to predatory ones. What was the mind of Christ? Carnegie did not think it pacifist, and he could not see that the history of Christianity spoke of a pacifist view either. Christian civilization at every stage of development has been one of the most warlike civilizations the world has ever known. Were they to acknowledge that Christian history altogether showed a fundamental misunderstanding of Christ himself? Christianity had not prohibited war they had made war less likely and less cruel. Discussing the secondary causes of war, as the bishops had so deliberately done, would help nobody. Men war with each other because they are at war with themselves. They will not cease to do so until they have established order, ordered peace in their own souls. We turn now to a new section in this journal, Church Reviews, and it's a picture and story of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, West Philadelphia. 
the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, located at 6361 Lancaster Avenue in Philadelphia, was initially organized in 1792 as the African Church under the leadership of Absalom Jones and Richard Allen. Both Jones and Allen left Philadelphia's St. George's Methodist Church in protest against its racially segregated seating arrangement. The African Church was the outgrowth of the Free African Society that was formed in 1787 by Jones, Allen, and other free black citizens of Philadelphia. The purpose of the Free African Society was to establish a place of worship as well as mutual aid society for black people. On 17, July, July 17, 1794, the African Church renamed the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, formally opened its doors for worship. Absalom Jones was the lay reader and deacon of this new congregation until being ordained priest in 1802, becoming the first black priest in the Episcopal Church. The historical significance of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas as the first black Episcopal Church in the United States still has contemporary impact. The current congregation is very culturally diverse with continued membership from the African diaspora, including the Caribbean. It is the largest black Episcopal church in the United States. Many of the church's initial per parishioners were from African countries, brought to this country enslaved, and eventually found Philadelphia as their home. Many of these Africans were freed as the church's founder, Absalom Jones, African Caribbean and African American cultures have influenced the liturgical service of St. Thomas. On a visit to St. Thomas for worship, this reviewer notes the ambiance of the altar areas rich in color as it represents the many colorful patterns from African cultures. All the cloths used for the perificators Corporals, chalice, walls, altar table, and hangings are accented with African fabrics such as kenta, mud cloth, and other vibrant pattern fabrics. Acolytes, vestments, and choir robes are accented with African fabrics as well. Additionally, the 14 stations of the cross that appear throughout the main body of the church are wonderful watercolors painted by an African-American artist. We turn now to table talk. We're discussing difficult words. We're discussing Zion. I'm sorry, vanity. Vanity. When Paul and Barnabas brought the gospel to Lystra in the book of Acts, they urged the people to turn from vain things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth. What were these vain things? People had made their own gods and followed their own inclinations. And labeling it, labeling it all vain, Paul and Barnabas were saying it won't work. Rather, the people were to repent of their own devices and seek to serve the living and true God. It is as we give ear to the Creator God that we are directed away from the futile ways that seem right to us, to the fertile way that yields life. The Apostle Paul expresses the salvation of God in Christ in terms of vanity. It explains the effectiveness of Christ's work. 
He adds, and if Christ had not been risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And if Christ is raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But Christ has been raised. Our faith is founded. Our hope is not empty. Our life in Christ is not meaningless. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Another word, Zion. Imagine, give me a second here, the jubilation after a good king. And you have a picture of what Zion stands for in scripture. The term Zion refers primarily to the mountain on which the temple was built in Jerusalem. Just as scripture unfolds, it comes to symbolize God's victory over his enemies and much more. Shadowy Zion. Zion's story begins with the Lord's choice of it. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for its dwelling place. But in order to dwell there and establish his reign, the Lord first needed to defeat the enemies who opposed him and occupied his mountain. These are the Canaanites, specifically the Jebusites. Having subdued the enemies, God establishes his city. He has Solomon build the temple in the middle of the new city. The climax comes when Solomon moves the ark from Zion, the old Jebusite city, to the new Zion, the Temple Mount, 1 Kings 8.1. God crowns these labors with his glory coming down to fill the mountain. Psalm 132 celebrates these events at the Lord's enthronement as king on the earth. Of course, God always reigned as the creator, but now the Lord is publicly recognized as the rightful king of all the earth. So when you think of Zion, think the Lord, think of this, the Lord reigns. On Zion, the Lord is enthroned as the high king. On Zion, the Lord has established David to be his vassal king, who reigns on his behalf. Regardless of literal elevation, Zion is the highest of the mountains of the earth. For from it, the towers over all the people. The center of the earth is Zion, where the Lord, the King of all, exercises his rule. From Zion comes the Lord's kingly rescues. To Zion come all the Lord's people to worship him and offer fealty. Zion is the place where we see, as nowhere else, the glory of God's reign. It is the new Eden, the most beautiful place on earth. Thus, Zion represents God in a way that no other place does. His name dwells there. To see the glory of Zion is to see the glory of the Lord. To despise Zion is to despise the Lord himself. And as God's reign rat radiates outward from Zion, so also does the name Zion in concentric circles. Zion regularly refers not just to the Temple Mount, but to Jerusalem as a whole, which is sometimes called the daughter of Zion. Zion can also refer to the entire people of Israel. Given that Zion symbolizes the Lord's invincible reign over the world, it is astonishing that Zion falls to nations. How can the temple, the very throne of God, lie in ashes? Micah 3.12, Psalm 125, one. The answer is that God himself abandoned his throne because of his people's rebellion against his kingship. Yet even after its destruction, Zion remains the heir of staggering promises. The prophets promise that God will again reign in Zion, even in greater glory. 
when the Lord returns in the person of Jesus Christ, he comes to reign not from a temple on earth, but from a heavenly temple of the heavenly Zion. A shadowy Zion was a copy of this ultimate Zion all along. Think about how glorious the first Zion was. And now realize how glorious the ultimate Zion is with the consummate victory of Jesus. You and I are citizens of heaven. And one day this mountain will fill the whole new creation. We turn now to the word gates by Thomas Keene, doctor, associate professor of New Testament and dean. Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington. <clears throat> Pretend for a moment that you, like Simon Peter, are an ordinary and faithful Jew awaiting the consolation of Israel and living during the time of Jesus' ministry. Who is Jesus? He must be more than a prophet. He's even greater than Moses. Peter comes to the inevitable conclusion. He must be Messiah, the promised king, the anointed one who would restore the kingdom of God upon earth. Yes, Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The little word gates conjures up an image, or rather a network of images, experiences, and associations, many which might be lost to the modern reader. As Peter meditates on this prophetic word, his imagination will project a cosmic war between two kingdoms, one besieged, built of death and darkness, and protected by a great barred gate, the other triumphant built of living stones and surrounded by wide open gates, beckoning the multitude to enjoy its peace and light. Perhaps your imagination was more meager in its reflections, and a brief tour of gates in the Bible will help us better envision the victorious city of God. The modern reader is at a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to the metaphorical description of the gates of hell. Metaphors often draw from lived experience, and most modern cities no longer have gates in any literal sense. The word gates no longer immediately triggers the same set of associations for us as it would have for an ancient reader. Ancient cities needed protection from their surroundings, and so most cities end up with some sort of surrounding wall. The gates of these walls act as a centralized entry and exit location, and this in turn makes them a suitable place to meet and converse, a central marketplace, a spot for public announcements and legal proclamations, Ruth for and the prime location for community gatherings and celebrations, Judges 511. In short, the town center and public square in the ancient world usually was not in the center of town, but on the edge of town, at the gates. The gate thus symbolizes the city itself. It represents the people, culture, status, prominence, and life of the city. He is promising them a city with high walls and strong gates. Revelation 21, 9 to 27. It's interesting then that the picture God paints for us of the heavenly city has its gates thrown open wide. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ye ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Psalm 24, 7. The psalmist is speaking of God's sanctuary there, describing it as a kind of city. When the king comes into the city, the gates are opened wide to receive him. 
The tone is celebratory and victorious. The Lord of Hosts has entered the city. He will protect its walls and secure its safety. Revelation is even more emphatic. The high walls of New Jerusalem are punctuated by a dozen gates. That's a lot. These gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. So many gates, and they're always open. This is a stunning dis and brazen display of confidence, security, peace, and camaraderie. By contrast, the gates of hell are shut. The devil would have us think that this is a sign of his strength. But in reality, it is a fear that bars these gates. The gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ and his church. In this image, Satan's city is besieged, its gates crumbling before the hosts of heaven and the people of God. Properly understood, hell isn't a mighty fortress or flourishing city. It is a prison, 20 verse 7. And when this city prison is finally destroyed, its demonic citizens will be thrown into the lake of fire, no longer able to harm or hinder the blessed people of God. Praise be to God. Come, Lord, quickly. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ye ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. We turn now to Standard Bearer, a synodical sermon on 1 Corinthians 13. I have all so that I could remove mountains. This same expression is frequently used by Jesus to describe the strength of genuine faith. So we should think not of a person with a name it and claim it faith, which is a false faith, but of one who through the most difficult trials of life quietly trusts in God without complaint. A Job who losing 10 children in one day. In a second here. <clears throat> Blessed God, his sovereign God, I might have such a faith. If I have not charity, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, <clears throat> these words do not describe the philanthropy of the extremely rich, but rather the religious activity of one who's given away all his possessions in order to provide for the needy and now lives a very modest life. Well, it could be traveling the world and living in a mansion, he instead has given away his wealth in order to help others and to lift them from poverty. Surely this has to be love. Who would do this? But Paul says that even this can be done without love. It may be for praise, for an ego trip, or even a religious exercise to merit with God. Without love, such generosity amounts to nothing. Though I give my body to be burned, this describes someone so committed to the cause of Christianity that she allows herself to be slowly burned to death by her persecutors. Surely this is simple. The one's willing not only to let goods and kindred go, but this mortal life also. Yet a martyr without love is nothing. He is a hypocrite. The reasons, but why? Why, without love, does everything amount to nothing? First, love is indispensable because God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. First John 4 8. To know God is to experience the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, to express the same experience in our external relationships. We may do many signal things, but without love, they are, without God, empty. Second, love is indispensable because love is the bond of perfectness. Perfectness, 
This is the way to think of the life of God triune, a perfect bond. This is also the way to think of our life with God and our life with other believers. Third, love is indispensable because the sum of the Christian life is contained in this one word, love. This is how Jesus positively sums up obedience. Love God and love your neighbor. This, he says, is the summary of all the law and the prophets. This is our basic debt to God and our neighbor. Fourth, love is indispensable because it is the first fruit of the Spirit, an outstanding mark of the Christian. An absence of love is evidence of the absence of the Spirit. And if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The application. With regard to the Synod and its work, the application is this. That God will answer our prayer for his presence and the work of his Spirit in our deliberations first giving to us as delegates the attitudes and behaviors of love here described in 1 Corinthians 13. Let us remember this week the words of verses 4 to 7 that describe the behavior of love. Not only as we work with each other, but also all the work of the synod that comes before us, missions, a seminary, contact committee, appeals, and more. The applications of this message ought to be considered both personally and corporately. In the church, we have many gifted people. These are God's gifts to the church. There are gifted theologians who can understand scripture with clarity. There are gifted preachers who are easy to listen to and whose ministry has a wide impact. There are gifted authors who with words and books and blogs are able to ask critic, answer critics and questions. There are people with gifts of music, prayer, money, generosity, leadership, witnessing, and encouragement. These are the people with all kinds of practical hands-on gifts or projects that are necessary for the continuation of the Lord's work. Individually, God has gifted you in some way. Paul has in mind personal gifts when he says in verse 1, though I, the word calls us here to consider how we can use our own gifts. We turn now to Standard Bearer, the Second Helvetic Confession with Robert, Professor Robert, Ronald Commander. Marcion of Sinope, 85 to 160, taught a dualism of equal ultimacy of good and evil. The God of the Old Testament, whom he called the Demiurge, the creator of the physical world, was a local deity of the Jewish people. In contrast to the wrathful God of the Old Testament, Jesus preached to God who was loving and merciful. Marcion denied the Incarnation and taught that Jesus only appeared to be a man, much like angels in the Old Testament appeared as men. The early Church Fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and Tertullian denounced Marcion as a heretic. They rightly insisted that only if Jesus actually became a man could he redeem men. Bollinger concludes the paragraph, therefore, the flesh of Christ was neither imaginary nor brought from heaven, as the heretics wrongly imagined. Christ was really and fully a man. If he is not truly a man, neither could he redeem us men, a rational soul in Christ. Moreover, our Lord Jesus Christ did not have a soul bereft of sense and reason, as Apollinaris thought nor flesh without a soul, as Eunomius taught, but a soul with reason and a flesh with its senses, 
by which in the time of his passion he sustained real bodily pain, as he himself testified when he said, My sorrow is very sorrowful, even to death, and now my soul is troubled. Did Jesus have a real body? Did his humanity extend beyond his body and include his soul? That's the question answered by Bullinger in this paragraph of the Second Helvetic Confession. It never fails that when I put these questions to teenage catechumens, they hesitate. And when I follow up with Jesus had a human body, but a divine soul, right? Almost all the heads in the catechism room nod in agreement. Then I ask the students to turn with me to the Belgic Confession of Faith, Article 18. And I read aloud the first paragraph of the article, the title, The Incarnation of Jesus Christ. The last part of the paragraph reads that Christ did not only assume human nature as to his body, but also a true human soul, that he might be a real man. Give me a second here. If Christ did not assume a human soul as well as human body, neither could he have saved human beings in their souls. What has fallen? Is only our body fallen and depraved? Or is our soul fallen under the power of sin and in need of salvation as much as our body? The latter, of course, is true. We are totally depraved, and it belongs to the totality of our depravity that extends to both body and soul. If Jesus only saves our bodies, he is a half-savior. Only if he saves us body and soul is he our complete savior. In this paragraph, Bollinger says that Christ possessed a rational soul. Sometimes it's been said that Christ possessed a reasonable soul. This is the expression that is used in the Athanasius Athanasian Creed, point 32, which confesses concerning Christ, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting. All that is meant by these expressions is that Christ had a real soul and with it the ability to reason. In order to prove that Christ did not only have a real human body but human soul, Bollinger cites two scripture texts. The first is Matthew 26, 38. Then saith Jesus unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. The second passage is John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came unto this hour. Bollinger refers to two heretics who denied that Jesus had a real human soul. The first is Apollinaris of Laodicea, sometimes referred to as Apollinarius, died 382. To his credit, Apollinaris was an outspoken critic of Arianism. However, his fervency to defend the full deity of Christ led him to deny that Jesus was fully a man having a human soul. His error was condemned at the First Council of Constantinople 381. It is the creed of Constantinople crafted by this council that is quoted above. In addition to Apollinaris, Bolger cites Eumonius of Sicus, died 933, 393. Eunomius was a leader of an extreme Aryan sect. The sect was known as the Anameans from the Greek, which means not similar. That is, Christ's essence was not similar to the essence of God the Father. They were called Heterousians, which is another name, expression meaning of a different substance. That is, Christ's essence was essentially different from his essence of the Father. The members of this sect were also called Eunomians, after their most distinguished leader, Eunomius. 
so ungodlike was Jesus that he possessed only a human body without a soul. Binomius' views were also condemned by the First Council of Constantinople. But the Orthodox of all ages, the Reformed faith, confesses Jesus Christ to be true God and true man for us and for our salvation. Turn to Bibliotheca Sacra. As we take a look at Epiphany. And the Nativity. Baptism and Jesus' first disciples. As we've learned from Luke. Jesus was on the threshold of his 30th birthday when he was baptized in the autumn of A.D. 29. Luke provides this information at least in part because this was the age when Jewish men customarily began their public ministries. Following his baptism, Jesus underwent a 42-day fast in the wilderness, followed by a period of temptation also in preparation for ministry. Since preaching was Jesus' life work, it seems safe to assume he would not have delayed beginning his public ministry by a protracted period of fasting and temptation fo following his 30th birthday. The better view, therefore, is that Jesus' fast and temptation were timed to conclude on or just before his 30th birthday. So that he could begin preaching immediately upon returning 30. November 8 plus 40 days brings us to December 18. Christ's temptation following his fast probably spanned several days, placing us at or near the received date of the Nativity. This is confirmed by John's Gospel, in which after his fast and temptation, Jesus returns to John at Bethabara, where he makes disciples of Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Andrew and Nathaniel call Jesus Rabbi, demonstrating he is now of age to make disciples and commence his public ministry. In the words of Irenaeus, for how could he have had disciples if he did not teach? And how could he have taught unless he had reached the age of a master? For when he came to be baptized, he had not yet completed 30 years of age. As mentioned, his years has expressed it. Now Jesus was, as it were, beginning to be 30 years old when he was baptized. We turn to a modern Reformation an interview with Dr. Daniel from the Ethiopic Church, both Orthodox and Evangelical. There seems to be strong evidence to support the Protestant concern that in the structures of the Orthodox Church, Mary is exalted as high or even higher than Christ. Although these claims are not accepted by the church's theologians, Yaakov's composition, which explicitly exalts her as a savior, is read as part of the worship in the church. Moreover, prominent preachers, teachers, and singer, singers continue to use the platform of the church to exalt Mary, angels, and other saints in a matter that is due to the living God alone. Hailing the Orthodox tradition as an authentic form of Christianity and depicting the evangelical one as foreign also continues to drive the followers in two traditions apart. On the other hand, evangelicals tie their identity to the Bible, but their expression of Christianity has limited indigenization. Perhaps because they were rejected and persecuted by the Orthodox Church, they distanced themselves from indigenous Ethiopic expression of worship and ways of life. 
Moreover, their indiscriminate criticism of the Orthodox offends the ancient church and most of all hinders evangelicals from admiring the unique Christian heritage that the EOC has preserved at an immeasurable cost. Question. Why are these doctrinal disagreements so important to both EOC and evangelicals? As I indicated above, the status of Mary can sound like Christology for Orthodox believers. Maintaining tradition is also very important for the Orthodox. What is handed down from the Fathers is to be preserved and passed on. Moreover, in the debate about the priesthood of Christ, Orthodox believers raises a question about Christ's equality with the Father. Since Jesus is co-equal with God the Father, how can he offer prayers? but receive them. Evangelicals, on the other hand, maintain the authority of the Bible, the sole mediatorship of Christ, and the eternal coexistence of his human nature with the divine one. Understanding these positions and their sources is important to address questions that are of greater theological significance both to the Orthodox and Evangelicals. Question, what approaches do you think are advisable or not advisable as evangelicals continue to pursue biblical faithfulness and positively engage these doctrinal disagreements? Collective depiction of the orthodox as this or that is quite unhelpful. Expecting the orthodox to prescribe to an evangelical tradition is also inappropriate. Maintaining respect and expressing one's convictions with love is important. Dialogue is a way forward. For a true dialogue to take place, both parties need to accept each other's coming from different traditions, but with a common heritage. Knowing the church fathers and their teachings is also very important on the part of evangelicals. Genuine interest in indigenous expressions of Christianity is some, something evangelicals have yet to work on. We seem to have more confidence in theologies developed elsewhere than in EOC descriptions. And we'll draw this to a close. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God speak.